Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and once again, let's discuss the James Webb Telescope. Let's discuss some of the new images released by the telescope in the last week or so, and also talk about one major issue it has recently experienced that the scientists are currently having trouble resolving. But it's not really going to jeopardize the mission in any way, it's just making some things a little bit more difficult. And now let's actually maybe start with that. So what's happening with the James Webb, and what is that new glitch? Well, first of all, as you probably already know, this is not the first time there is a glitch on the telescope. We've discussed the first issue a few months ago, when the scientists discovered signs of a relatively large meteoroid impact that affected one of the mirrors. But as you know by now, because of the design of the telescope, it actually has not affected much in terms of the general operations. And as a matter of fact, these collisions are expected. You can find a little bit more detail about this in the video in the description. But the new glitch is something that was unexpected and currently does not have a good reason or a good solution. And in this case, the glitch is inside the instrument known as MIRI, one of the main instruments responsible for mid-infrared imagery. And as you can see from this animation, whatever is happening inside the telescope is ridiculously complicated. It actually has one of the most sophisticated three-dimensional structures ever produced in any telescope. But very recently, during one of the observations, the telescope reported unusual data coming from MIRI itself. There was an unusual increase in friction in one of the mechanisms when operating in the medium resolution spectroscopy mode. And this really complex instrument has four different modes of operation. The imaging mode, low resolution spectroscopy, medium resolution spectroscopy, and coronography. With each of these modes passing their initial tests back in June of 2022. But a few months later, and specifically at the end of August, during the operation of medium resolution spectroscopy, the science team detected a small problem with one of the wheels. Specifically, one of the wheels responsible for the motion inside MIRI. And for some reason, there is an increased amount of friction inside this mechanism, which might with time cause a bit of an issue. But there was no issue yet, and nothing is broken. But because the scientists want to be super careful with the telescope, and they obviously don't want any of the parts to wear out too quickly, they decided to pause all of the future observations of this particular function inside MIRI, relying on the three remaining modes, which seem to be working properly. But until the engineering team can figure out exactly what's happening here, they're not going to be able to find a solution. Chances are though, within the next few months, they will. Because as we know, the engineers at NASA are some of the most brilliant engineers on the planet. I didn't really get to talk about this yet on the channel, but just a few weeks ago, the engineers have already found a solution to one of the glitches on the Voyager probe, that I've talked about a few months ago. And so if they manage to fix this almost 50 year old probe that's one of the most distant objects in the solar system, they're definitely going to be able to find a solution to this problem as well. And once they do, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. So subscribe if you want to learn more. Anyway, let's discuss some of the new images released by the team, with some being kind of mind blowing. I actually wanted to start with the one that was just released. The image of the most distant planet in the solar system, Neptune. And an unusual star you can see right here. Guess what it is? So this is the first time ever we've seen Neptune in this unusual light. And as it becomes pretty obvious, this is the first time ever we've seen Neptune's rings with so much incredible detail. And some of these rings have never been seen before. Making the rings of Neptune appear almost as big as the one around Saturn. Although they're definitely not and they do have very different formation history, because as we've recently learned from Saturn, and as we're going to be discussing in another video, which might have been already released on the channel, in case of Neptune, the rings were most likely formed by some kind of an ancient asteroid coming a little bit too close to the planet, and very likely coming from the distant parts of the solar system. Although to be honest, at the moment nobody really knows how exactly they formed. Then, by zooming in even closer on the planet, we can actually start seeing some of the darker spots, which are produced by the methane gas, which absorbs some of the infrared light that would be otherwise visible to James Webb. As a matter of fact, compared to for example Saturn, which was very bright in these particular frequencies, Neptune appears relatively dark, with a lot of frequencies being absorbed, except for occasional high altitude clouds, which appear extremely bright because they're above the methane. But interestingly, these particular clouds are very likely made out of methane ice. So it's the methane gas that's absorbing, and methane ice is reflecting. With this barely visible thin line on the equator that you can kind of see right here, very likely representing the global circulation of the atmosphere on the planet, which powers pretty much all of the storms and all of the other weather effects on the surface of Neptune. With another intriguing feature being the previously known vortex at the southern pole of Neptune, which sort of looked like this in the Hubble images. 
in this case also revealing a continuous band of clouds surrounding the vortex. But at the same time, the image also captures 7 of the 14 known moons, with that extremely bright star I previously mentioned being Triton, the biggest moon of Neptune that orbits in the opposite direction of everything else. And so most scientists today believe that Triton was very likely captured from somewhere on the outskirts of the solar system, specifically the Kuiper's belt, and is very likely extremely similar to objects like Pluto. But what makes this image so unusual is how bright Triton is in these frequencies. It really looks like a star. And that's because most of the surface is covered in nitrogen ice. Once again, very similar to what we find on Pluto. And in this case, nitrogen ice reflects certain frequencies of light, specifically the infrared frequencies, making it appear extremely shiny from these distances. And so while Neptune itself is relatively dark, Triton is extremely bright. Making this an extremely intriguing image that's going to be providing data for months and even years to come. And then we have another image from the solar system, this time a little bit closer to home. For the first time ever, James Webb released the images of Mars. But because Mars is so close to us and because it's actually quite bright, and also because the James Webb telescope is relatively sensitive, the scientists had to use several observational techniques in order to avoid what's known as detector saturation, or essentially the excess of light that can generally prevent the telescope from being able to see anything. And so here the scientists used very short exposures, allowing only some light to enter the telescope, which allowed the scientists to see some of the dust layers, several different craters, and various dark spots, and an unusual dark feature you see right there known as Hellas Basin. And the reason why it's so dark is of course kind of interesting. So first of all, one of the main reasons why there's a very bright spot on the left side of Mars is because that's basically where the sun is warming up the regions. It's where the sun is almost directly overhead with some of the cooler areas being along the poles of the planet. And because in this case the observations are in 4.3 microns of infrared light, it actually is directly related to the temperature surface of this planet. And so the brightest regions basically show us the hottest regions. But because we also know that CO2, carbon dioxide, tends to absorb some of these frequencies, which is of course why it's also known as the greenhouse gas, and because we also know that most of the atmosphere on Mars is carbon dioxide, some regions, such as various grooves or various craters that are much deeper than the rest of the surface, will generally contain much higher atmosphere because the atmospheric pressure here is going to be much higher. And in this case, the Hellas Basin is one of these regions. There's more CO2, more atmospheric pressure, and thus it appears slightly darker. Because CO2 is absorbing some of this light and does not allow it to reflect, but keeps it inside the planet warming up this region. In other words, this is a visual representation of the effects of greenhouse gases. But more importantly for scientists, the instrument was also able to measure the atmospheric composition of Mars, and unlike various rovers on Mars, which only measure the atmospheric composition very close to where they're located, in this case, the instrument was able to see the entire atmospheric column, allowing it to capture pretty much the entire atmosphere and all of the gas emissions coming from here. Which is really important because the scientists really want to solve one of the major mysteries on Mars, the unexplained detection of methane, for example, which has been previously discovered by one of the rovers, but has never really been officially rediscovered or proven to be formed somewhere on Mars. And so by doing this more thoroughly, the scientists might actually find the source of methane and thus figure out where all of this is coming from. Methane is of course really important because it's one of the possible biomarkers. So by finding its source, the scientists might be able to answer the question of maybe life on Mars or potentially discover a very unusual inorganic source of all of these molecules, while at the same time helping the scientists discover some other unusual elements, such as for example hydrogen chloride that has previously also been discovered on Mars, and thus allow them to understand the planet a little bit better. But for now that's all we know about Mars. And now for the last image, we're going to go a little bit farther away. The beautiful Orion Nebula, one of the most iconic features in our neighborhood of the Milky Way galaxy. And in this case, we now get to see the inner region of the Orion Nebula, like once again we've never seen before. Which, if you were to look in the night skies, is part of the much bigger structure referred to as the Orion Molecular Cloud, with the nebula itself visible right there. And so here is kind of what we're looking at in this image. For example, right here, one of the young stars becomes quite apparent, with another star, Orionis A, being even brighter and more easily visible than ever before. For the first time ever, we also see some of the young stars with extremely young protoplanetary disks and actual cocoons formed around them, as well as certain other features such as these filaments that you see, very likely formed by various magnetic interactions. 
And the main purpose for this image is essentially trying to understand how early stars form and what happens in these star birthing regions, which is extremely similar to the one where the solar system was created as well. For example, we know that various ultraviolet emissions from extremely young stars generally play a very important role in changing the gas and the dust clouds in the regions where these stars form. And in this case, this very bright and very powerful triple star definitely seems to have quite a lot of effect on the nearby gas. Something that was actually previously invisible to us, because as you can see right here, the image from the Hubble telescope was unfortunately unable to uncover all of this since these regions also possess quite a lot of dust. And so only infrared observations were able to ignore the gas and were able to reveal the objects and the features we've never seen before. While at the same time all of this extremely powerful light also very likely chemically changes the cloud as well. And so trying to understand how all of this works and also how these other features such as these filaments form as well is of course one of the main reasons this image was taken. And here's how all of this compares to the previous image from the Spitzer telescope, the telescope that operated for nearly 20 years also observing everything in the infrared light. And so all of this of course implies that a lot of the activity inside these clouds is sort of interconnected. And though these dust clouds definitively produce these stars, the stars themselves then also create the necessary conditions where the clouds evolve and change dramatically based on the amount and the power of these stars, creating a kind of a feedback mechanism. And that's of course what the scientists want to understand a little bit better. With this particular object being particularly interesting, because it really shows us how young stars form, and in this case providing extreme resolutions, allowing us to see things that are relatively similar in size to our own solar system. But that's of course just the beginning, and so many more images are going to be released in the next few weeks. And that's because the scientists are still processing this data, with one of the more exciting images very likely coming in the next month or maybe two months, the images from the iconic TRAPPIST-1 system. And we'll be definitely talking about that when it comes out. So make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. And so until these future images, thank you for watching, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that now features James Webb Telescope as well. And either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.